O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Jesus said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Now the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Hallelujah. We pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of the prophet Joel, chapter 2, reading verses 28 and 29. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the servants, both male and female, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with our psalm for the day, Psalm 51b. It's found printed in the worship folder.
Our second lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and it is the account of the events on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were like fire resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When this sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to each other, Look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, They are full of new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them, Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And this will happen. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of our God. Alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Please rise. The Gospel according to, the, to John, chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. Glory be to you, o Lord. But now I am going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asks me where are you going. Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the day. Come, O come, life-giving spirit, number 181, verses 1, 3, and 5. Oh, 
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you, redeemed children of God and dear Christian friends. The portion of God's word that we shall celebrate today on the day of Pentecost as we gather in the house of the Lord is taken from the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens above and on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to be blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord has called. These are the words of our God, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. It was probably about the 1960s, during the turbulent 60s, that people began to notice that the church was losing vast amounts of members. And many people, looking at the upheaval of the world at that point, had this to say to the church. Christianity has brought us to a pretty pass. Now what did they mean by that? What they meant by that is Christianity has had its opportunity and it's failed to bring about a heaven on earth. And so it's time to ditch it. It's time to get rid of it. It's time for something new. It's time for us to rise up and make this world apart from those things that were preached from pulpits and sung about in hymns. On a day like today, still recovering from COVID-19 and that pandemic, in the midst with our world, our country again, thrown into turmoil, doesn't the church appear to be absolutely anemic? Don't we appear to be absolutely helpless? Doesn't the words of that man that he spoke 50 years ago seem absolutely true? I mean, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Can our hymns stop the spread of disease? Obviously not. It's the fact that we've had to take the hymnals out of the pews and wear masks. Do our prayers have the power over microbes? Can me in this pulpit stop what seems to be the unstoppable violence and upheaval in society? I must appear as anachronistic as a person riding in a buggy down the street, as, as a wagon pulled by an ox cart today. Why are we doing this? Why have we gathered? Why are we here? The answer, of course, is clearly told to us in the prophet Joel. Joel today opens our eyes to how things really look. He gives us a Pentecost perspective because Joel is telling us how the world looks from God's perspective, from Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven 40 days after he rose from the dead, 40 days after he had given proofs to the world that he had conquered death and brought life and immortality to life, he told his people, I have taken all authority in heaven and on earth. It has been given to me. As we saw last week, Jesus Christ ascends to the throne not to pull back from the world, but to go out to the world. And today, today we celebrate the inauguration of that. The inauguration of him pouring out the Holy Spirit on the world. You heard it in our gospel lesson today. The whole, Jesus Christ tells his disciples, he tells his church, it's good that I go to the right hand of my Father, for I will send my Spirit to you. And that is the Spirit of power. That is a spirit that will change hearts. That's a spirit that will change lives. And that, brothers and sisters, is why we have to realize the most important blessing that we can ever possibly have is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we must look at the age in which we live, and the age between Christ's ascension and Christ's return as the most glorious age we can live in. And this is why. In the Old Testament, Elijah was having a very, very bad time. He had performed perhaps the greatest of miracles. Fire had come down from heaven. It had lapped up 
all of the water had lapped up the sacrifices, all the people had gathered on, on the top of Mount Carmel said, oh yes, the Lord is our God. They had done away with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And Elijah's pumped. Elijah's ready. Elijah's saying, all right, now, now we're going to return to the Lord. And the very next day, Jezebel had put a contract out on his life. And Elijah runs into the wilderness absolutely dejected. He just wants to die. He felt the same way you and I may feel this morning. What good is this? We're no better than our fathers. We're no better than all the people who came before us. We failed. We failed to change the world. We failed to do anything. It's all for naught. He goes deep into the desert, all the way down to Mount Sinai. And there, there, the Lord comes to him and says, Why are you here? And he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord. But I'm the only one left. And the Lord tells Elijah to go out to the mouth of the cave. And there is a great whirlwind, so great that the rocks shatter and fall apart, but it says God wasn't in the whirlwind. Then a great fire appears. But God was not in the fire. And then a great earthquake happens. And God is not in the earthquake. And then, and I still love the King James Version of the Bible, it's, it's the most eloquent translation of this section, a still, small voice. And at that, Elijah covers his face because God was in the voice. Why are you here, Elijah? And Elijah gives his same complaints again. And this is what the Lord says to him. That's nice. Get up and go back. Get up and go back and anoint Elisha, your successor. Go up and anoint this king who will punish all those whom Ahab and Jezebel have done, anoint this man king over Israel, and he will capture and, and take care of those who, who do such injustice. Oh, and by the way, just in case you think you've done no good, there are 7,000 in Israel alone who have not kneeled to Baal or kissed his mouth. You are not alone. What God did for Elijah on that day is show him the power of the spirit that filled him the power of the Spirit that filled him. He was filled with God's Holy Spirit, and when he spoke, yes, people did come to repentance. When he spoke, yes, people did come to faith in their Messiah. And do you know why today is so exciting? Do you know why today we should be as excited about Pentecost as we should be excited about Christmas and of Easter? It's because on Pentecost, that power that filled Elijah fills all of you. That's God's promise. Listen again to the words of our text. After this, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Make no mistake, we don't have a select group of, of prophets like they did in the Old Testament who had this power of the Spirit filling them. Every single believer has this power. You have seen it, although it has come in such humility that, that you forget it. Who of you is not moved when you see that, that preschooler here on, on a Christmas story get so absolutely worked up because he's telling you about Jesus? Who of you is not moved to tears? My, my favorite memory of preaching in this congregation is not of me or even of Pastor Weedman or any other. It's my daughter Madeline for the Sunday School Christmas program when she grabbed the microphone and pulled it away from her other friends to tell me that it came to pass in those days that Jesus Christ was born. Almost screaming the words. Here we have, here we have Jesus Christ. Here he is preaching us. Who of us is not moved by the mother who sits by the bedside? and reads the, the Bible stories to their children or goes to bed? Or who of us does not see the power in the Father who not only reads the scripture at the table, but shows that his life is measured by what God has said and walks the path that God has laid out for them. Each one of us is filled with that power. We've all been called to different callings, some to be mothers, some to be fathers, some to be children, some to be teachers, some to be pastors. But all of us have been filled equally with the power to convict of sin 
and to show people Christ. And that is not our power. We are just the messengers. Every once in a while, a student will ask me, Pastor, can you tell me exactly what you do? And I say, sure, I'm a mailman. That's all I am. I'm a mailman. And not even a real good mailman at that. I make mistakes. I get the wrong house sometimes. I screw up. But what's amazing to me is that even in this weak, cracked vessel of clay, God fills us with his spirit. Even in people as weak and foible as us, God fills us with that power, and that power does make a difference. And that's the age we live in. We live in the age where there's not an Elisha and a Moses but every single baptized child of God, regardless of your sex, regardless of your color, regardless of your education, regardless of your economic standing, is a prophet of God. And wherever God has called you, you are called to apply that law through which the Holy Spirit convicts the world of its sin and apply the gospel, which gives the salve of eternal life to all who listen to its sweet voice of Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself by dying and rising again. But friends, what is the purpose of this age? One of the things I have to remind people, and especially remind us of that man who said Christianity has brought us to a pretty past, but he looks at the mess of the world, is Christianity was not given to us, and Christianity is not here to make a heaven on earth. I'd like to remind everyone here of that. Christianity is not here to make a heaven on earth. There's a very practical reason for that. Christ Jesus has gone to heaven to make heaven for us and then to bring us to be what he has made for us. I don't have to take any part in that. Jesus Christ has not only accomplished my salvation, he has accomplished the glory that I shall have for all eternity, and I patiently await that. But we live in an age, an age of rescue, and Christ here, in his words, reminds us in his words that this is an age that he has set signs in the heavens above and the earth below. And listen to what some of those signs are. I will show warning signs in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. What should be our reaction when we see smoke rising? What should be our reaction to a horrible pandemic in which 100,000 people die? What should be our response to great and gradual charities? If your response is, well, I'm glad I wasn't there. If your response is just kind of a callous self-righteousness, then you've missed the point that God has left these things in place. God has left these signs and these terrors in place to remind people who live in this world of two things. Number one, this ain't heaven. And for all of you who think it is, and of all of you who think this is the heaven I want for myself, it will not last. And of those who think this is this heaven and will use whatever power necessary to oppress and kill so that they can keep their heaven on earth, God will overthrow you. He's done it to all nations. Read history. There aren't, isn't even a Roman Empire anymore. There's not even any Romans anymore. Do you really think what happened to that will not happen to us? Is heaven simply the United States of America? I sure hope it isn't for you. Is heaven merely a, a, a million dollars in the bank and a grocery store that, that we can fill? I sure hope it isn't, because all those things will pass away. Friends, heaven is, is beyond anything we can possibly imagine. Heaven is, is a place where there is no more sin, no more crying, no more pain, no more injustice, no more murder, no more crime. Those things are put out forever. But the problem with human beings this side of eternity is that we, we tend to get comfortable in our sin. We tend to like our sin. And so God needs to shake us from our deafness, shake us from our blindness. What reaction should I have? to the abuse of power, to violence in the street, my first reaction should be, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. My first reaction should be, God, have mercy on us, for we have sinned. 
my first reaction should be to get down on these kneelers, not because it says in the bulletin I should kneel at this point in the service, but because the weight of my own sin is so great, I cannot help but stay on my feet. That should be my reaction. And that is why God has left these warning signs in heaven. That is why God has left us so that we don't get comfortable, so we don't fill ourselves with the narcotic of this age. That our word is what matters, that my vision is what heaven should be, but that all of those philosophies are empty and worthless and will never bring about anything, and that the only thing that is true and noble is that which God has provided. God has left the signs and times for all of us, both inside the church and outside the church, may learn to cry with that tax collector in the back of the temple, Lord, have mercy on me. So that we may cry with that, that, that man who had that son who was demon-possessed and brought him to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. So that we can have the joy the Apostle Paul had when Ananias showed up at his house and baptized him and embraced him as a brother, him who had persecuted and hunted down the church, now is embraced by the church. So we may have the joy of the jailer in Philippi, who after the earthquake, thinking that all of his prisoners had disappeared, thinking that he was going to die, pulled out his sword and was about to kill himself, and Paul stopped him and said, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And he was joyed, not simply because his job wasn't taken away, and not simply because his life had been saved, but he realized at that moment, I'm missing something bigger, I'm missing God, tell me about them. And that very night, he and his whole family were baptized into Christ. That, that is why God has left these signs in the times. That's why he's left this age, to call us to repentance, to call us to his word. And where is that word found? That's the last thing I want to share with you today on this great festival of Pentecost, the very final verse of our text, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has promised, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Do you know why Pentecost took place in Jerusalem on Mount Zion? The same reason Jesus had to be crucified in Jerusalem, the same reason that he had to suffer and die and rise again to fulfill the scriptures. But there's an even more practical purpose than just fulfilling the scriptures, just knowing that this is the place where salvation is. It is to let all know where you can get the right and good and true word that saves you. Every Sunday we confess the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, and what makes those true statements of faith is because they are showing us that only in this word, only in the spirit that God has filled, will we find salvation. It is said that those who have God as their father will have the church as their mother, and that is true. For the church is nothing more than those who have gathered around Christ in Christ's name, preaching Christ's word to the world. You are prophets. And the prophet does three things. He foretells of God. He tells what God is going to do. We know what's going to happen to this world. We know how it will end. He's told us. And that is why we can't sit still. That's why we can't keep quiet. Because we don't know when someone may die. We don't know when this world can end. That's why today, if we have this opportunity, let us gather, let us worship let us share the word of God. We tell about God. We let people who are lost in darkness, we bring the torch of the gospel into that darkness to show them light, to show them the way out. I think of how joyous it was. I believe it was last summer where you had all these, these children who were trapped in a cave in Thailand and how joyous it must have been when the rescue diver got into that cave, came up and said, I'm here to save you. I'm here to bring you out of this darkness back to light, back to air. That's what a Christian gets to do when we say, here is the font, here is the church, here is the word of God, here. And finally, brothers in Jesus Christ and sisters in Jesus Christ, we get to tell and bring the joy of salvation. I know, I know it seems weak 
just as it seemed to Elijah. I know it seems that, oh, if we only had more power, if we only had more joy, but friends, remember who's doing his work. God is the one who is gathering. God is the one who is convicting the world. God is the one, and so our job is to let God do his work, and we let God do his work by faithfully standing and saying, this is what God says. This is what God says. These are God's words. I just want to close this sermon by sharing a little, one of my favorite quotations of Martin Luther. I know a lot of people think that what, what good is this? Elijah thought that. And someone once asked Luther what he attributed to the power of, of his 95 theses. Why did it have such a, an effect on the world? And he simply shrugged and said this. I simply taught, preached, and wrote about God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank good Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince and emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. If we wish to inflict losses upon the evil forces of this world, brothers and sisters, our weapons are the law of God and the gospel of God that he has filled us. Our weapon is the spirit that fills us. And let us live that spirit, not merely with words and tongue, but with actions and truth. Let us live that spirit by forgiving love, by being the servant of our neighbor, by not insisting on our rights, but rather by saying, how may I bring Christ into the life of a person in this world so that they may see and have the joy of salvation that I have? That is the Pentecost perspective. Amen. Would you please stand? And now may the peace of God surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds and faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in Jim, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Please rise for the prayer of the church. After each of the petitions of the prayer, please, as a congregation, respond with, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have blessed us in love with the Savior, to whom the nations cry and in whom is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Grant to us your Holy Spirit, the comforter whom you have promised, that we and all who call upon his name shall be saved. Help us to treasure in our hearts your mercy and to give ourselves fully to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you delivered your word through Moses and the prophets and fulfilled your word in Christ. He was planted in death for our sins and raised for our justification, and in him shall all the nations of the earth be united. Give us pastors who will preach this word faithfully and church workers who are devoted to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised the thirsty will drink from the e- the thirsty will drink, and from the empty will flow forth rivers of living water. Help us to show forth in holy lives the fruit of the Spirit, and to live with love toward our neighbor. Give us a servant's heart that doesn't seek our own way, but walks on the path of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to make one people from the many. Take from us all pride, prejudice, and hate, that we may not hinder the cause of the gospel by our shame, but give welcome to all people in the name of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who are affected in every way by the recent violent death of George Floyd. Bring the perpetrators before the justice of law. Comfort and support George's loved ones, especially his two children. Work forgiveness and peace in the heart for all who are angry, especially to all in the African-American community of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Guide us, spirit of peace, to work to defeat in ourselves and in our communities prejudice, intolerance, hatred, and sinful anger, and to walk the way of love, peace, and unity. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity here on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear your prayer. Almighty God, you have ordered all things in heaven and on earth. Bless Donald Trump, our president, Gavin Newsom, our governor, and Eric Garcetti, our mayor, the Congress of the United States, and all elected and appointed civil servants, that the rule of law may protect the weak, preserve life from conception to its natural end, and peace may reign for the benefit of all. Use our government and communities to help restore the losses of businesses affected by the violence. Restrain those inclined to violent responses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over and guide the police officers. Cause them not only to fear man's justice when they sin, but to first and foremost fear the justice of you, the Almighty God and Lord, who have endowed them with the power to restrain the evildoers in our community. May they be terrified of the very thought, not only of harming their neighbor, but in doing so, losing their eternal soul. Protect and support the faithful police officers who must deal with the consequences of this and similar events, and restore trust between police and citizens in turbulent communities. Lord, in your mercy, your prayer. Almighty God, have mercy and spare us. Put an end to the pandemic and restore the communities of the world to their common life. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have given our nation the gift and heritage of freedom. It came at the cost of many lives on battlefields far and near. Receive our thanks for their sacrifice, 
and give us the courage to preserve liberty in our own time and to use it honorably. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you breathe hope into the weary and renew your church by your grace. Bless newly planted congregations that they may endure. Guide established congregations that they may not lose heart. And build up our synod that our zeal for your kingdom may not flag, but flourish and prosper according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you carry the burdens of our lives in your hands. Deliver from illness and suffering all who cry to you for, for release. Hear us on behalf of the sick, the dying, and those who mourn. Answer your people, O Lord, and deliver them from their infirmities and their grief by your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your word endures forever. Give us grace so that we may be united in doctrine and in the fellowship of your table, confessing Christ boldly and living together in faith and love until our Lord returns in his glory to bring all things to their appointed completion when we will dwell in his house forever. Lord, in your mercy. Okay. Almighty God, hear your people for the sake of him who loved us even to death and who lives to call himself or to call to himself all who will be saved. You know what we need and those things we should ask in your name. Grant them to us for the sake of our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join also in the prayer that you taught us, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people, until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here today. Uh, a note to the members of St. John's and Calvary. Uh, we will be having meetings this very day to try and look at what it means for observing the regulations and rules on reopening. And we'll be trying to come forward with a timetable that is both wise and able to follow the law for us to resume our worships in person soon. So I should have more information on that for you shortly, but please bear with us for a little while longer as we strive to go forward with wisdom and obedience to the law. I have a couple announcements uh, for us today. First of all, um, uh, Joan Meals, our dear sister in Christ, who uh, uh, passed away uh, during these uh, times of quarantine, we will be having a memorial service for her next Sunday here in church at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. That will be live streamed for those who, who cannot attend uh, for whatever reason, but uh, we will have it. We will have the social distancing that you have experienced today as well. That will also be in a force uh, for that uh, funeral service as well. Many have asked about the funeral of Mary uh, Helen Haar. Uh, the final announcements for that those funeral will be uh, posted this week, but there still is a, a little bit of issue about the date. Uh, and I will, uh, I will make sure that uh, we give you a very hard and firm date for that uh, funeral. Um, uh, this week. Uh, the funeral for Myra, Myra Barons is still pending. Those funeral arrangements are still pending, but I hope very soon to have um, a funeral date for uh, Myra Barons as well. Um, there will be a council meeting on June 8th, uh, 2020 at the normal time of 730. The elders will meet, but please take note, it's at 630. Okay, elders will meet at 630. Okay, not six o'clock. So we're, we're uh, 
moving up our meeting, our, making our meeting a little bit later. Um, we will also hopefully have the vacancy pastor, uh, um, uh, Pastor Charles Found, uh, in attendance as well uh, to uh, uh, bring everybody up to speed, especially the elders, uh, some of the needs of our congregation. So we will be having that elders meeting at 6.30, uh, not at 6.00. Uh, there will be a call meeting for uh, a new pastor here at uh, uh, St. Uh, St. Paul's. That will be on June 14th, so two weeks from today, June 14th, here in the uh, sanctuary immediately after worship, immediately after worship. So uh, following uh, our, our regular uh, morning worship, the, uh, we ask that everybody who, who wants to be part of that call meeting, please stay in place, um, and then we will start that call meeting immediately following that. Um, the last announcement I have is uh, some have asked when my, my final Sunday here will be. Uh, my final Sunday here will be uh, the 21st of June, the 21st of June. Uh, that will be my, my final Sunday. Uh, the moving truck is coming uh, the 22nd, 23rd. We're still waiting for a date on that. Uh, but uh, uh, the 21st will be uh, my last Sunday uh, serving you uh, in the pulpit here. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will give you more information on that as we get a little bit closer. Uh, now, if you'd like to turn and stay where you are and greet your neighbor in your pew while avoiding social distancing, you may do so now. <laughs> okay. We will conclude our service with our final hymn, and that hymn is uh, 281, 2, and 6. It's printed on page 13 of your bulletin. Mm -hmm. 